Hi, this is Peaceful Science. Uh, I'm Dr. Josh Swaminas, and I'm here with John Walton, a leading exegete. He's the guy who actually taught me what the meaning of the word exegete is. Um, and we are going to be asking the question to start out with, is he a six-day creationist? The answer might surprise you, because in some really important ways, I think he is a six-day creationist, but maybe not in others. And I think that's going to be fun to explore. But there's a lot more to discuss as we really look at what sacred history tells us and how that might entwine with natural history as well. So I'm really glad you're here to join us. And uh, John, thanks for joining us too. Can you tell everyone a little bit about yourself and where you're from? And you started at Moody, right? Moody Bible Institute, and now you're at Wheaton. Sure, Josh. Um, great to be here. Uh, I was uh, I was 20 years at Moody Bible Institute, and now I've been 20 years at Wheaton. So that means I'm officially old. And <laughs> um, I was raised in a Christian home and basically in a young earth context, not militantly so, but- Oh, you were raised by young earth creationists too? Yeah, yeah. So, so I I know that world well. I know that context well. Um, yeah, and so, so I guess Moody is is it right to call that a youngest creationist? Um, not necessarily. They don't have an official position on it. Okay. But I think most, many of the people there are, but that's. And then, and when you started there, you were a young Earth creationist, or is it I was really yes, really, in uh, almost through m many of my years there. I, I would have referred to myself as an uncomfortable young earth person, uh -huh. um, young earth, because I didn't know how to read the biblical text with integrity any other way, but uncomfortable because it seemed like I still wasn't doing something right, that there was something I was missing. And that, that I don't mean scientifically, I mean, um, hermeneutically, exegetically reading the Bible. So that so, alludes ahead. Well, you know, this actually explains some. I didn't actually realize this history. So when I read read your books, I noticed, I would say, you could definitely see the historical grammatical hermeneutic coming through in your work, right? Sure. Even though you do talk a lot about the lost world, you know, ancient Near Eastern literature, a lot of your arguments are very textual in a way that sure. um, is not always true of people who focus on ancient Near Eastern literature, right? That they don't always go together. Yes, yeah, so I picked up on that actually. So is that is that that young earth creationist background speaking through, or what is that? Well, no. I mean, it, basically, most of evangelicalism has been focused on historical grammatical. That just says you're reading the text in its setting, in its context, and really comparative studies, ancient Near East is part of that. Uh, you want to read the the language for what it says. You want to read the context for what it has. So. It's really just a matter of taking the text seriously in its context. So I continue to be basically historical grammatical in my approach. But, but just also including information, which makes sense. It's kind of like, you know, if you're going to read Hebrew, you have to know what the dictionary is, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's uh, basically historical grammatical says we want to understand the author's intentions of what they're saying. And as you know, you've read my stuff. That's really big for me but that also includes culture. So we could say cultural historical grammatical, and that probably would be more uh, accurate. But of course, when historical grammatical came up, cultural wasn't as big an issue. Yeah, so Ken Keithley, um, I think, has been really helpful in kind of decoding some of this for me, but even I think very conservative scholars that are not um, you know, necessarily in your camp and origins have actually really come over to really taking into account ancient Near Eastern literature. People like Greg Beale, and you know Seth Pastel and others like that's now kind of what everyone in the field is doing. Not that they're leaving historical grammatical, but you can't ignore what's happening in the actual context. Is that is that a good way to put it? Correct. Correct. Again, if you want to tether yourself uh, to the author, be accountable to the author, and for me, that's a way of saying accountable to God because God worked through these human instruments. If you if you want to be accountable you have to take account of their cultural context as well. Okay, that's great. By the way, you know, if you're listening in, we're really glad you're here. Feel free to ask um, any questions in the comments. If they're good questions, we might cover them here too. So feel free to feel free to do that. So one of the the things that surprised me most when we talked, I think it was it was it 2015 that we we actually had lunch over in That sounds uh, about right. Yeah. Yeah, you, uh, your wife, and you took me out with a gift card to a great restaurant. It was really nice. My wife and I, and so she still remembers that. We, uh, she was pregnant at the time, if I remember. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Caleb just turned five, so I guess it was about that. Time. <laughs> yeah. 
so um a question that um I and mean, one thing that actually struck me and surprised me actually when we talked is that you thought that the Genesis days in Genesis 1 were ordinary days. Now, you were really precise about it. You were saying you didn't say 24 hours because that's like a very scientific modern designation. You you thought they were ordinary. So first of all, can you explain to people what the difference between an ordinary day is and a 24-hour day and why you think that they're ordinary days? Well, you know, when when I was still in a young earth position, it was largely because as I read the Hebrew text, you know, there are all these discussions about is Yom uh, a regular day, sunrise, sunset, morning, evening, or is it an extended period of time? And as I looked at all the arguments for an extended period of time, I did not feel that they were well supported by the Hebrew text. And I've talked about that in some of the things I've written, my Genesis commentary, for instance. So if there was no other way than to see day as a regular period of time, then I said, okay, so how do I avoid being younger? I mean, what do you mean by regular? I mean, are you trying to say like like a regular two years or like 10, 000, a million years wouldn't be enough? You don't you mean like something close to what we think of as a day today? Sure. Well, you could say that, that yom, the Hebrew word for day, well, sometimes it's used to talk about kind of the daylight, the day period versus the night period. Other times it refers to both the day and the night, but both of those still refer to a regular day. It's not saying a day is a thousand years or a day is a geological era or things of that sort. And in Genesis yeah. 1, part of the context too is it's talking about morning and night. Sure. Yeah. So I felt kind of bound to that. And therefore, again, I said, I don't know quite how to work my way out of a young earth position. Um, even though that feels like I'm not doing the right thing. Anyway, when I finally... What, what, what made you feel like it wasn't doing the right thing? You're saying it's not science. What was it? Was it just an instinct or something more? Yeah, No, I just felt like I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not using the right criteria for reading the text. Again, basically what I would say about it now was that I was still being somewhat of a concordist. That is trying to read science into the text. Oh, so you were thinking about science. What, what do you mean by that? So no, 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 not trying to read, I'm sorry, not trying to read a scientific theory into the text, but trying to discern the text as making scientific comments. Okay. okay? And that's what I wanted, to, that's what didn't feel comfortable to me, because mm. the text is not doing science. So, you know, so those are the things I, that I struggled with. Yeah, so this is, this is an interesting thing to untangle too. We'll, we'll come back to talking about concordism later, I'm sure, but when you say to make scientific claims, a lot of people think that any statement about the physical world is scientific. That can't be what you're meaning. I mean, science does make statements about the physical, I'm sorry, not, well, science makes statements about the physical world, but it seems like scripture does too, right? Well, they made comments about the physical world around them, but they wouldn't entail some of the scientific principles, natural laws, uh, issues. Sure that we would involve, that that's, goes without saying. Uh, some people are comfortable reading those back in, but besides the strict concordism, when you read stuff back in, there's the idea of trying to say that the Bible is making scientifically reliable statements. That's another level, it's another issue. And yeah, I, I mean, I think that that is a problem. I mean, science is a very bizarre way of engaging and talking about the world. It's right. It's very precise in a way that doesn't actually match normal use of language. Right. So I would be I'm saying like that universal the Bible is addressing yeah. genetics or biology or chemistry or those kinds of things. Yes, it understands that living things exist. Is that biology? Well, kind of, but not the same way that we talk about it. You know, they have no, uh, you know, chemistry. Uh, they have no chart of, you know, all of the chemical elements and, uh, there's no implications of those things. And again, that's nobody, nobody tries so to- So maybe a way to put it is that you're kind of coming at it from a scientific frame of reference? Well, that's what apologetics often does. And I'd come out of that kind of world. Hmm. And so you moved out of that. And I think that, that one thing that has certainly really altered my view of it is actually becoming a scientist. When you start to understand how particular the scientific way is about talking about things, how idiosyncratic it is. It just becomes, starts to become very ridiculous to think that 
that right. structure would talk that way. I mean, it, it just doesn't make any sense at all, you know? So at any rate, it seemed to me that the, the I needed to interpret the days as sort of regular days, not elongated or not ages or things like that. So what changed was uh, not the decision that days should be interpreted differently, but rather a change in what is the Bible presenting as going on in those days. Yeah, See, so you're you're known for kind of saying that Genesis 1, for sure, and also Genesis 2, is taking a functional view. It's telling a functional story about how a home is made, not how the house is made, rather than a material. Um, can you explain concisely uh, for people who are new to your work? I mean, most people are going to be familiar with that. But for people who are new to it, what do you mean by functional? Well, as time has gone on, I have... Uh, adopted what I think is better, not contradictory, but better terminology. When I first wrote about this material and tried to figure out what, what is the juxtaposed word I'm going to use, what's not material, but something else, and functional was kind of the best I could come up with. I am now much more content, and uh, I think it's much more helpful to talk about the word order. I used to talk about uh, the idea that everything had a role and a function in an ordered system that had purpose. And that's that ordered system part. God is ordering the world. And as he orders the world, things are given their function. I think for a moment to the, the old musical, Fiddler on the Roof, and you know tradition. And there they have order in their community, but that order is comprised of all of the specific roles and functions that different people have. The papa, the mama, the son, the daughter, the rabbi, the matchmaker. Everybody has their functions so that the system is ordered. It's almost and kind so, of a naming sort of. Yeah, it's purpose. There's purpose to it. And so now I talk more about the idea that the creation story in Genesis is a story about God ordering the world with a purpose and giving things functions within that ordered system. Okay, so now the, the, the criticism that a lot of people make to your work, um, well, so if I, if we, we talked about this, just to make sure I had you correct. Um, the reasoning is a little complex and I don't, I don't want to, uh, to, to not do you justice on that, but you don't think that there is a material component to Genesis one and two. Now, I think most, uh, exegetes I've talked to would agree with you actually on the functional part. The part they disagree is in the negating of the of the of the material component of it. Is right. that a, a fair way to explain the situation? People ask me that question all the time, uh, either personally or in reviews or in Q and A sessions. Why can't it be both? Why well, can't it be? It be both? But you're saying that there's no strong evidence for it being material. Well, it? so this is how I explain it. I would say yes, it could be both but that doesn't mean it must be both. I have to prove that it focuses on order and function. And somebody who wants to have a material component has to prove that. That is not just that they as a researcher and reader are interested in that, but rather that the biblical text is interested in that and is addressing that. Now, as I go day by day, and this is my basic proof of why it's not both. If you look at the first day, what does God create that's material? He creates day and night, light. These are not material. The second day he creates space, open space. That's not material. The third day, it says, let the dry land emerge. He doesn't, it doesn't say he made the dry land. Let plants sprout. Day after day after day, he's not dealing with material objects. We get to day four and we say, oh, that's material. He made the sun, moon, and stars. Okay, but notice that it says he made them to be lights, to rule over. He's giving them functions in the ordered system. And in fact, when an Israelite would have read he made them, they wouldn't have said, oh, God is manufacturing these material objects. Because in the ancient world, they do not know that the sun, moon, and stars are material objects. Yeah. No one knows that. They think they're lights. And God made lights with a function in an ordered system. 
So if I was to summarize, I think the key issue is that you're saying is that you really have they, they, they you don't think they've made a strong case, a positive case for a material layer, and they really have to. Uh, right, you have to show that that's what the text is interested in. All right. So, you know, I mentioned to you, I have an illustration. If I can share that for a minute. Sure, go ahead. Okay. So uh, say you're going to a play and because of traffic and construction and weather and parking and whatever, you get there half an hour late and you walk in and, you know, you're really frustrated and you poke the person next to you and you say, how did the play begin? Now, this person being very congenial uh, and helpful says, well, the script was written in 1939. You say, no, 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 no. That's not what I want to know. He said, well, you can't have a play without a script. I said, well, I know that, but that's not my question. Well, somebody else on the other side says, well, this, this stage was constructed in 1950s. And you say, no, no, that, that's not what I want to know. They say, well, you can't have a play without a stage. Somebody else would say, well, this set was put together. No, that's not what I want to know. Well, the cast was chosen. No, no. Okay, all of those, here's the point. All of those are right answers. But that doesn't mean I want to know all of those. I don't care. I'm sorry. I don't care about the script and the set and the stage and the cast. I know they're important, but that's not my issue. I want to know what's taken place since the curtains opened. Now, in the same way, you can talk about creation from many different perspectives, all of which are true. You could say you need a script and a set and a stage and, a, and all, all of this. Well, fine. So somebody will say, well, Dr. Walton, how can the text be talking about functions and even order if there's no material, huh? Well, I'm not saying there was no material. I'm just saying you know, that, that wasn't the question they were asking. That wasn't the issue they were interested in. Well, of course I, I, you I like needed. Your, I like your analogy a lot. Can I, can I play with it a little bit? I want to ask you a question about it. Sure. So, so if we take that analogy, analogy. Um, um, well, are you getting an echo? I am. Okay, you're I'm not. not. Mine no. went away. Okay, that's good. What I would, what I, what I'm curious about is, you know, I've actually told that same story, but in a slightly different way to make an argument. It's talking about two things. So, in a proclamation day view, it's kind of like the play, where it's like a seven day play almost. You can imagine it could be happening over a literal six, seven, six days, or well, not seven days. I guess six days. It's a story being told, but that story is referent to a much larger period. Um, so it could actually be really both at the same time too, right? Um, I mean, that's actually how every play works. Every play has two timelines. There's a timeline of the actual progression of the play on your stopwatch, and then there's a progression of the timeline of the play of what it's referent to, right? So, sure. for, so for example, when you watch Hamilton, it begins with, uh, you know, events that happened like over 200 years ago, even though we can talk about how the play is starting, uh, you know, eight hours from now. <laughs> so there's like kind of like a dual timeline to it. So it really is literally a play that takes over the course of what, like three hours. It's mm -hmm. also a, a play that literally, you know, takes place over the course of like a, like a couple of decades. I don't know exactly how long um, uh, Hamilton covers. Um, so that sort of dual talking, I think makes a lot of sense, but then, couldn't it be both then? It always depends on what you can determine that the author intended to do. Certainly the author of Genesis understood that there was a material world, but that wasn't, in my view, that wasn't his interest in framing the story. Sure. So you always have to ask what his intention was, not what I can fit into it that I like, well, but, I mean, the one part that pushes me towards like the multi-layer approach, I'm kind of curious your response to this. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, there's so many different directions I want to go with talking to you about this, John. It's been a long time. It's been fun. But, you know, you know, if you look at how Jewish people read scripture, you know, not the original audience, but afterwards, I'm talking about like Talmudic readings and such. Um, there was often a real high value on finding multiple layers, like a new layer to the text that people had missed. Um, they didn't really narrow it down to single layers. They were often, you know, multiplying the numbers of layers they were looking at. Was that just wrong headed what they were doing that? All interpreters do that. They reappropriate the original text for their circumstances and their culture and their questions and their issues. That's expected that they would do that. 
I don't want my interpretation to start by seeing all the multiple layers that every reader has always read, has, you know, not always, but has, has repeatedly read into it. I want to start with the layer of the author of the text as best as I can discern it. We can consider other layers as we move along, but I want to get that first layer because that is going to determine what the authoritative truth claims are of the text, not the imagination in the reappropriation by readers of this, that, or the other. Well, it, I mean, I, I agree with you. It does become an interesting challenge, though, when we consider the fact that scripture is embedded in a history and in an interpretive tradition um, that extends both before Jesus and it includes Jesus, and it also extends after him as well. Um, I'm not sure we can dismiss that tradition. I'm not dismissing it. I'm just saying, let's take it in its turn. We sure, start I'm with fine the with that. Context. And this actually gets to the fact that you're an exegete. So you're wanting to focus on what scripture is saying. So you could still be, you're not saying to ignore the work of the historical theologians. Nope, just or take it in just, But what you're bringing to the table is let's talk about the scripture or actually says in the original context, then we can kind of move on to the others, which right. I think is actually very helpful. That, that actually explains a bit. Now, so what I want to start to... with texting context, then we can move to the New Testament and church history and historical theology. But that's that's further down the road. Take things in order. Yeah, I mean, I think that that, that makes sense. Okay, so I want to actually kind of take what you're thinking, and I want you to kind of break apart what uh, Ken Miller is sharing here. Ken Miller is a scientist who's actually published a lot on faith and science. I can't my friend. None of this is like personally critical. It's just actually going over a key part of his response to my book at the AAR conference. He, um, at that conference, he he really uh, gave me kudos, quote unquote, for making a correct distinction between genetics and, genetics and genealogy and agreed with that part. The part where he disagreed on was actually in terms of understanding scripture. And this is one of his key points. And I want, I'm gonna play uh, some pieces of it. And, uh, and I wanna hear your thoughts. His argument is really that He's, what he actually said is that my book is a heroic attempt to rescue the narrative, but it fails because of this. And I want to hear your thoughts on this. Let me let me see if we can get this to play. ...false narrative in terms of geology and natural history. And I'm not going to go into comparing Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, which is rather easy to do. But just look at the sequence in Genesis 1, which has the clearest day-by-day -day account of creation. Uh, light as created... Uh, the, the sky is created, then we get dry land, plants, and trees, and those plants are somehow flourishing without the presence of the sun. Uh, I would also note that uh, even a theonary like John Calvin noted that Genesis says that God made a great light, the sun, to rule the day, and a lesser light, the moon, to rule the night. When modern astronomy or semi-modern astronomy showed that the moon, in fact, wasn't a light, it was a reflector, Calvin considered that a threat to the literal nature or literal reading of Genesis. He tried to explain it by saying that Genesis spoke to the people for whom it was written, uh, given the concept of cosmology in that time. And therefore, all right. So we're going to pause there. What's your response to that so far? Well, if you're going to assess something as false, you can only do so on the criteria of what it presents itself as doing. You know, I wouldn't say that uh, the Odyssey and the Iliad are a false narrative of geography. They're, they're not trying to present the true geography for all the world, but they have certain assumptions. You can't, you can't judge something as false for something it's not doing. We wouldn't criticize the parables because you couldn't go interview the Good Samaritan. It's not doing that. So the Miller's comment might be apropos for some people who are trying to make Genesis 1 a true narrative of geology and natural history. But that's not what we ought to be doing, and that's not a good criteria to use. But it's weird, though, because he even talks about your ideas. He says that your ideas demonstrate that it's a false history. He says that, oh, well, not your ideas. A lot of people think this. Um, too. Again, I mean, I think it makes a lot of sense. He's saying that if, if they're describing it in their own language, then it's a false scientific history. Does that make any sense? I've clearly said that the Bible is not teaching, for instance, cosmic geography. It's not saying this is what everybody 
uh, of all times and cultures ought to believe about cosmic geography. Here's the biblical truth of it all. And I'm arguing against that, that no, the Bible is not trying to affirm a particular cosmic geography. If it's not trying to affirm one, it can't be false in the cosmic geography that it happens to reflect. This is the difference between what well, that's, there's a nuance here because it could still be embedded in a false narrative that it isn't affirming. You can only call it a false narrative if it's trying to affirm a truth and it's not doing so. It's just, a, this is the difference between reference and affirmation. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it comes down to how you're interpreting creation versus him. He's really talking, frankly, about material origins. <laughs> and, and you're and saying more that, you know, the actor was cast to do this. And I think one of the key issues here is intrinsic to the text. There's morning and night before there's light. How is uh, that possible? But see, that's all assuming that we've got a chronological sequence, which I would say we certainly do not. So it can't be a false chronological sequence if it's not intended to be a chronological sequence. Yeah, I mean, I, the way I responded to him there too is I, I pointed out that, you know, scripture doesn't speak with scientific precision. And it seems like he's really asking Genesis, something written like what, 4,000 years ago or so, or around that, um, you know, to, to talk almost like it's a science paper, right? Well, and I get the impression that he's criticizing people who he thinks are doing that. Um, now, you know, there are people who try to read Genesis as true science. Um, and uh, again, then that would be a criticism you could level. But I would contend you shouldn't be trying to read Genesis as true science. That's not the kind of truth that it affirms with its authority. All right, so let's see what else he says, and I'm kind of curious your thoughts about that. All right. Therefore, a scientific mistake of not realizing the moon was not luminous on its own was not a fatal error. Uh, and then finally, we have creatures that live in the sea and creatures that fly, and those creatures that fly are created uh, a day before we have creatures that live on the land. The evolutionary sequence shows very clearly that there were creatures on the land who gave rise to creatures who fly. So if you're going to try to, rec uh, to rescue Adam and Eve scientifically from that narrative, you're going to have to do something about the false natural history narrative uh, that basically doesn't match with science at all. Now, my bottom line. All right. So what's your response to that? Well, again, he's making it a chronological. Well, he's addressing people who consider it a chronological sequence. And I've made a very, uh, repeatedly made a case that it's not a chronological sequence. And therefore I don't have to worry about what comes when. But furthermore, I would contend that the Bible is not talking about mechanisms. It's talking about agency. Science talks about mechanisms. The Bible doesn't address mechanisms. Science can't really talk about agency. That's what the Bible is concerned about. And therefore, to try to assess the Bible scientifically as if it is talking about mechanisms, and I know that when Miller levels that criticism, he's talking to people who he thinks are doing that. Uh, the Bible's not talking about mechanisms, in my view. It's talking about agency. And so again, it's not an issue where the Bible is making scientific truth claims. So I think one question that comes up from listening to what he said is that there is an order there. Do you think there was a there's some other meaning or purpose behind that order if it's not meant to be chronological? Yes. What is yes. it? I think the first day, uh, the first three days have to do with the primary structures of order. No, structures are not a good word. The primary ways that order comes into our lives, time, space, food. You know, that's that's our ordered world. And so he's talking about those larger issues first. Then in days four through six, he talks about the things that populate those three areas. And so again, he's not dealing with things chronologically, he's dealing with things more topically. First three most important things, then the three things that kind of make that all work. That sounds a lot like the framework view, right? Or it, the framework view is compatible with what 
what I believe. It's just that in the framework view, they think that's all that there is. Whereas in my view, I tend to think, no, there's a lot more going on here. Well, yeah, like it's the temple inauguration, which sure. actually makes a lot of yeah. sense. That is, it's being ordered to be a place of God's presence. It's being ordered with the purpose of God dwelling with his people in relationship with them. That's all day seven. And when people leave that out and just talk about the six days of creation, they miss the most important part. That makes a lot of sense. So let me ask you some questions moving to Genesis 2, which I think are, are important, which I think also these are places where you're often misunderstood. But I'm, I'm And I've really enjoyed talking to you and finding out surprising things. Now, you made a case that you're not sure about the material side. You don't think it's there. But at the same token, you actually think that Adam and Eve are real people in a real past. Variously, I've heard you say different things about this. Maybe it's because of theology at times or New Testament, or maybe even stuff intrinsic to the text. Maybe it's the genealogies. I'm not sure. Why do you think that they're actually real people in a real, in a real, uh, in real space? If you only had... Genesis, would that be enough? Or is it really the whole picture together? What's going on there? Why do you think that? Uh, the text, the biblical text does not typically create fictional characters. Uh, and therefore, my default is that they are not fictional characters. Now, again, I call them archetypes, as you recall. And that's a particular function that they play in the narrative but even archetypes are real people in a real past, like Abraham. Okay, and so in that sense, um, that doesn't being archetypes doesn't remove them from being real people in a real past. Uh, the genealogy in First Chronicles uh, tr puts Adam in the genealogy, and to me, that's significant. Uh, the New Testament uh, treats him as historical, and if I find no reason not to then I'm inclined to, to that default. And so in that sense, uh, once I rule out, which I do, when I rule out that they're not necessarily the first and only, and therefore that this does not have to do with development of the human species, then I have no difficulty with accepting them as real people in a real past. Yeah, well, this is an interesting point too, because I mean, I think, I think they still can be the first and only humans from a textual point of view, from a scriptural or theological point of view, because scripture isn't talking about the human species, is it? No. Uh, again, I would say that they could be, but they don't have to be. But species that's, is a very scientific term. I mean, it sounds like concordance. And concordance, no, I think, is talking about that. That's why I don't deal with it. I just say if they are the first and only, that's fine. If they're not, that's fine. I, I demonstrate that there are hints in the text that they are not. The only ones around, Cain's wife, Cain building a city, Cain yeah. being wife, others will kill him. But also, uh, I would look at the difference between Genesis 1 and 2. That is, Genesis 1 does not mention Adam and Eve and does not talk about only two. It talks about a population. And that's before Genesis 2. Well, yeah, I mean, so, it's funny. I mean, I, I agree with you. Honestly, one thing that struck me the most about your book on Adam and Eve, honestly, John, was... There's all the ancient Near Eastern literature stuff, but your argument for the sequentiality of Genesis 1 and 2 was a very textual argument. It was very mm -hmm. much about the actual language of the text. Mm -hmm. And then, um, honestly, as I've looked back on Genesis, I think seeing people outside the garden actually allows you to take a far more literal reading of Genesis 2 and 3. I mean, <laughs> to actually see the earth as that area and the garden in a localized area, you have to ignore large portions of text to think the garden extends across the whole earth or that. Right. There's an outside the garden. And so like, how does that happen? I mean, like, as like, as a young earth creationist, I didn't really clearly think about, it. I mean, I wondered about it sometimes, but it never struck me in all my commitment to, to literalism, all the conflicts that young earth creationism had with literalism, what was going on? Well, again, they have their answers about where Cain got his wife. After all, if Adam and Eve lived 900 years, there were several generations born and they could marry their sisters. Or, I mean, they've got their explanations. Um, but again, uh, I'm not trying to prove what the Bible the garden had borders. Say. I'm the trying garden. to acknowledge that there are options and alternatives available. Yeah, yeah. But the, but the garden had borders, though. I mean, that's what it literally teaches. Oh, yeah. Sure. I mean, unless they were exiled to the moon or to Mars or something. Yeah. No, no, they weren't. 
So I don't know. I mean, I, I, I honestly, I have a hard time seeing the Young Earth creationists reading as coherent with a literal reading of Genesis anymore. Hey, here's a good question that came up that I do want to put up here for you to give you a chance to answer. What's your opinion of the salvation of people outside the garden? I understand there's no answers in the Bible, but I'm sure you have an educated opinion. You know, at, at this point, I'm afraid that I typically fall back on what is a very unsatisfying answer. If the Bible doesn't tell us, we don't know. We, we can't make all of that up. Once people are in the image of God, and we don't know when that happened, once people are in the image of God, then they are working alongside of him. But the Old Testament story is not the story of salvation. I know people disagree with me on that one. Um, but it's, well, not, it's the not the story of the people outside the garden, right? <laughs> it's, it's the story of God's presence with his people. And so salvation doesn't even come into the issue for Israelites. Um, they're, they're not thinking about when can I be saved from my sins? I can't wait till Jesus comes. You know, they're working with the, the sacrificial system and the temple that God gave them. And God said those are sufficient for them to do. But that's not about salvation. That's about being in relationship with God, with him dwelling among them. So we have to shift our narrative away from the meta narrative that says this is all about salvation. I don't see that in the Old Testament. So... But, you know, to take the question on its own terms, though, and it, as a speculative thing, it could go either way, maybe, right? Or do you... you know, how are people in the Old Testament saved if Jesus hasn't come yet? Again, the Bible doesn't deal with those issues. And that's that's God's purview, his prerogatives. And we're, we're content with that. At least I am. A uh, scandal of particularity, right? <laughs> That God somehow works through particular people in particular ways. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's a good that's a good answer. It's close to mine. I, I think. I mean, I, I think we don't know from Scripture, but I do think that there's some value in wondering about it. We uh, can wonder all we want, but if we <laughs> expect answers, you know, we, we really can't speculate our way to or wonder our way to uh, confident answers. Well, if you understand it, as you're saying right here, is that you're doing the exegetical work of what Scripture is saying? I think the right answer is that Scripture doesn't tell us. But that's not the end of the conversation. We can start then asking what theology might tell us. We can tell, we can wonder what all those things, right? And that's part of the conversation too, right? Or no? I'm I'm sure that's part of a theological conversation. Yes. Um, but you're not. But you you do theology too. What am I What am I missing here? <laughs> Are you trying to stay in your lane? No. Yeah. I mean, I I don't want to presume to speak uh, intelligently theologically. I I do theology like everybody does trying to figure things out. You know, we do have passages in Romans. We have that famous passage about all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. But then it goes on two verses later to talk about how God put off his treatment of sin, his punishment of sin, awaiting for the day of Jesus. And you get a good idea that somehow that's all involved with everybody before Jesus. And that doesn't necessarily mean starting with Adam. It means starting with everybody. Um, but again, it really doesn't give us a whole system to explain all that. Hmm. So that brings me to, I guess, a larger question. I'm kind of curious your thoughts on this of how, I mean, there really is a lot of stuff that comes to play. There is science, there's exegesis. There's also different types of theology. There's, um, there's many different types of science too that are relevant. You know, we all have like really hyper-focused expertise. Like how is the conversation, the dialogue supposed to happen between them? Is that possible or how does that happen? Well, it's very difficult. Again, you know, are, are theologians going to pay attention to exegetes? Are ancient Near East specialists going to pay attention to theologians? Are scientists going to pay attention to, you know, it, it's a matter of each of us using our expertise to try to bring together or uh, whatever knowledge and training we have to come up with solutions that work in every realm. Oh yeah, that's called the body of Christ. Uh, we each have our gifts that we bring to the table. It's when each group works only in isolation and doesn't care about what the other group's doing that you run into more problems. I mean, so where are we in that continuum? Is there any place where there's good dialogue happening? Or well, you... Sure. I mean, uh, for instance, I, I make a pretty big deal of it that I really don't do theology. You know, I, I do text. I'm a text analyst. So are there people who are doing the theology side of what I'm doing? 
And there's a book that came out just last year by Giesbert Vandenbrink uh, called uh, Evolutionary, mm, no, uh, Reformed Theology and Evolutionary Models or something like that. Yeah. And he's a theologian. And he accepts a lot of the exegetical conclusions that I come to, but then he moves the next step and he starts dealing with that in terms of Reformed theology and how does that work? I think he does an excellent job of it. Hmm. Okay. And so, yeah, it's interesting. I, I guess it's been interesting to see. You're right. I do think that there are places where it happens. It also seems like it's not happening in many places. It would be, it'd be great to see a better or larger conversation happening. Sure. And, you know, in the past, Templeton has tried to do those sorts of things. Biologos has tried to do those sorts of things. Faraday has tried to do those sorts of things. So there, there are places that are working at it. Where do you think the, the roadblocks come? You're talking about people being willing to listen to one another. Is there anything else too? You know, I think we still put a lot of stock in being able to declare ourselves or consider ourselves right. Hmm. Um, and of course, once you do that, then everybody else is wrong. And this idea of uh, I'm going to be right, you know, I. I want to do accurate, faithful work. And I hope that some of the things I say are right, but the odds are I'm never really going to get a full glimpse of that. And so I'm not going to walk around saying I'm right and everybody else is wrong. I'm going to say, given my research and my data and my presuppositions and my theological understandings, my exegetical work, this is the best I can do. And to me, uh, it it has a level of probability to it based on the strength of that evidence. But if somebody else has different presuppositions, a different hermeneutic, different theological framework, uh, different exegetical conclusion, they can come to something totally different. And so in that sense, uh, I feel like we need to do some careful tent work. That is, you know, let's all get under the tent and talk about it and see what we can come up with instead of, you know, all you folks are out because you don't agree with me. And you guys are obviously wrong because, you know, we've got it right. Now, I wrote a piece on that for Biologos website uh, a couple years ago on being right and wrong. Hmm. I think that's really good advice. Um, I, I mean, I think, I think the the parable of the, the blind and the elephant is helpful because I think there is legitimacy to a large number of views. I mean, some people are wrong, <laughs> but yeah. a lot of us actually have a hold of something. It's just not the whole story. And it helps mm -hmm. when we can kind of pull back to see that maybe we have a piece of the elephant, but it's not the whole thing. We have to sort it out together, right? Yeah, yep. One, one of the things that I've noticed um, among a lot of people is that when you start talking about the dialogue between science and theology, you often, I mean, I've often seen that people get shied away with it because they're afraid of court concordism. How do you get past that fear to actually have that real dialogue? Because there's got to be a way to have dialogue that isn't concordism, in at least in a negative sense. But um, but a lot of times the dialogue between the two gets labeled that way. So how, how do you manage that? Well, it's it's not always an easy matter. We like to be able to think in terms of compatibility. Yeah, uh, that the Bible and science are compatible. At least I think so, and I use that kind sure. of terminology. Uh, it's another level to say, can they be harmonized? And my question would be, what do we mean by harmonized, and should they be harmonized, or is compatibility sufficient? Uh, other people are m more intent on trying to actually enmesh them with one another, um, and beyond harmonization to integrate them together. I'm making up these categories as I go. Uh, but that, that kind of integration, which often leads to concordism. Again, concordism, you can think about in two ways. I mentioned this already. One is taking our modern science and reading it into the text in places where the authors would not have known or noticed that they were saying those kinds of things. Uh, in that case, you've got spreading out of the heavens as the Big Bang or the expanding universe. The other way of concordism is to take the Bible and try to understand it as making scientific comments or affirmations that you then have to 
uh, either mesh with known science or reject science and do your own thing. Uh, build your own science. That happens, for instance, with the uh, global flood, when flood geology uh, re remakes science by what the scientific claims that it believes the text is making. So you can see that those are two different kinds of things, reading science back in and having science projected out of. Now, some people do them both and intermix them. You know, it's a mix and match. <laughs> uh, but But those are two different approaches uh, that can be differentiated uh, in what could broadly be called concordism. So Dennis Lamro, you know, is a well-known non-concordist. I found out something very surprising about him. He actually um, is a non-concordist in the sense that he's, he's against scientific concordism, but he actually would directly say to me that he's a historical concordist, though. He thinks that there's a historical concordance between those. Is there a difference between historical concordism and scientific concordism? I don't know that I've uh, had many discussions or I've read many things about historical concordism. Uh, I would say that I believe that when the Bible is speaking of events that it projects as real events in a real past, that I would believe that we should take them as real events in a real past. Okay, if that's what he means by it, well then I would, I would accept that. But of course, you've got the question, <clears throat> when is it dealing with real events in the real past? Uh, I think, Dennis, I don't want to misrepresent him, but I think that he would say that in Genesis 1 through 11, we're not dealing with real events in the real past. And the Bible doesn't necessarily want you to think that, although I don't know what, you know, I don't want to misrepresent him. I mean, I don't want to misrepresent him either. I mean, I invited him onto the podcast. Maybe he'll come at some point, but um, but he's not ready to yet. Yeah. But I guess... The way how he explained it to me is that kind of a priori, any discussion of Adam and Eve is about science to him, and there and it can't be a historical reference. Um, mm -hmm. So well, there's going to be concordance. So if you're talking about them real being real people in the real past, then it's scientific concordism because Adam and Eve are about science. Uh, and see that that's the cri that's the point that we would disagree on. I don't think they're about science, and therefore they could still be real people in a real past if you're not attributing scientific roles to them first and only. Um, so in that sense, again, Dennis and I have always seen Adam and Eve a little differently and that's okay. We, we love talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. It's, it's just interesting. Cause I, I mean, another one of your um, articles that I really liked, it wasn't a book, it was an article um, was where you looked at uh, the tower of Babel and the history of ziggurats, right? Mm -hmm. And your argument is that the Tower of Babel is actually a ziggurat. Uh, right. That's a, t I mean, how would you characterize that? That's a type of archaeological concordism or historical, like, what would you say? No, I mean, that's just reading the text. You're dealing with a tower being built that's, um, that's characteristic of the city, that is a central place in the city, that goes up into the heavens. Uh, the same kind of language is used for the building of ziggurats, that its top reaches into the heavens. And therefore, this is simply an idea of identifying something more carefully historically and archaeology, archaeologically. The difference is that I can claim, I think pretty confidently, that that is precisely what the author had in mind. Concordism struggles with the idea that that's not what the author meant, whether you're reading it in or projecting it out. Uh, that's not what the author had in mind. Whereas with the kind of thing with a ziggurat, I'm saying that's precisely what the author had in mind, uh, but we've lost track of it because we didn't know what ziggurats were anymore or how they worked. And that's because of the cultural distance. We can recover that, but we're recovering what the author and the audience actually believed when they read the text. And that's the difference. So here's a question then that's really related to this. Like, you know, I, I think I don't think it's really plausible to read Genesis as the origin of the human species. And part of that's because I know what we mean by that in science. It's just such a idiosyncratic and disputed definition. I just don't think Genesis can be referent to that concept really. Um, um, and so I don't think it's talking about biological origins, but when I read Genesis, it does seem to be talking about the rise of civilization, which is something that could be, could have been in their purview. Is it possible Genesis, 
uh, one, two, three, and four, like maybe Genesis, you know, even one through 11, like that's one of the themes that's there about the rise of cities and the rise of civilization. They certainly um, talk about that, but that's basically in the idea that people are now trying to establish order for themselves. And order for people has to do with cities and civilization and society and its shape. So they're talking about those things from their perspective, but with the idea of having order uh, being brought about. And what they want to show is basically that once people left the garden, intent on establishing order around themselves, instead of working alongside God to bring about his order, they were doomed to fail. They made some progress, domestication of animals, metal, music, right? Genesis 4. They made some progress, but there was always a downside and it always went south. And so in that sense, their attempts to bring order around themselves only led to now there's violence everywhere, Genesis 6. So it's, it's working around that theme of order and projecting as it understands those kinds of issues with order. So then where did where does where does civilization what I mean is like like from from archaeological slash anthropological slash scientific point of view, it's surprising that you know Homo sapiens are across the globe, you know, 70,000 years ago. Um, but really, you know, in the last 10,000 years, it's really when cities arise, when agricultural um, uh, you know, agricultural living really grows widespread where we move really from being a country gatherers uh, largely to being largely, you know, largely farmers. Um, and, you know, the first cities arise, you know, and that's, that's a really big shift and it's not biological because we all, we, we all had the same brains, we think, you know, going 50,000 years back, like it was, and that's not what's causing it, but somehow there's that shift that happens. Is there any, in the same way how there's a correspondence between like a Tower of Babel and ziggurats, is there any way to see a correspondence between that and uh, and and what we see in Genesis or is that stretching too far? I did my doctoral dissertation on the Tower of Babel. So I did a lot of study on when ziggurats first began. Yeah. When writing first began, when city building first began, what were the early stages of urbanization and what did that look like? What were the first cities? Were they places where people lived or were they administrative centers? Uh, I did all of that kind of research. Um, and uh, again, lots of that kind of, uh, even the use of burnt brick, all of that kind of comes together right about 3000 BC as ziggurats were beginning and urbanization was beginning and writing and burnt brick and uh, all of these things. Um, so. We can say that roughly, if we tried to locate it in history, we would look at that time period. But again, it's not the Bible's intention to give us information whereby we can reconstruct the events or the sociological pathways or the anthropological. Sure. It's, it's not trying to do that. I agree with that. So if I try to do that, then I'm off the rails. I'm doing something on my own that the Bible's not doing. It's just like I don't think that I can even begin to try to reconstruct the hydrological, geological event of the flood. The Bible's not trying to give me that information, and it's not talking in those terms. Yeah, so, I, mean, I, I, I agree with you on that. Um, I mean, if you look at that time, you know, 4,000, 5,000 years ago, we know across the globe, like this transition from, uh, from hunter-gatherer to, uh, to farming was a major societal transformation that happened and there was conflict around it even in areas now where, where there's still that uh i mean there's like a there's a like basically an ongoing narrative of conflict between farmers and um and hunter gatherers i mean it actually makes sense in that context that there's some commentary on that i mean i'm not an expert i just wonder but it's it's good to talk to exegetes and learn where i'm going too far so <laughs> well, again my question always is what is it that the biblical narrator wants to get across? I've got plenty of questions, but they're ones that the narrative doesn't answer. And the minute I try to make the narrative do my work of answering my questions, I'm I'm running a high risk of distorting what's sure. there. 
No, I, I agree with you on that. I mean, it's something to chew on. I, I guess I just wonder if part of the message, the original intent was to acknowledge like the progress being in civilization, but also question it at the same time. But well, certainly the text does that because the progress in civilization, unlike Mesopotamia, where kingship descended from heaven and cities were built by the gods, unlike that, hmm. the Bible says, no, actually, this was part of people trying to establish order around themselves. And that was a futile act and a doomed uh, thing from the start. Um, so, yeah, these advances were made, but I'm sorry, the downside was that it brought nothing but human failures to the surface. Yeah, so that's that's kind of what I'm seeing in the text too. I mean, it reminds me, of, I mean, we just, we're in Black History Month still, right? Mm -hmm. um, Martin Luther King and his Nobel laureate um, lecture and others too, he would talk about how he looked at America and saw incredible scientific and technological advances, but the moral advances weren't there. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I kind of get that same narrative in scripture when I read it. But regardless, I mean, we're coming up on an hour. Um, you've written a lot of books, all in this Lost World series and also other things too. What's in the works now? Are you, uh, are you working on anything else new now? Well, for the last couple of years, I've been working on a technical academic commentary on Daniel. Um, I've produced about a thousand pages of manuscript. Uh, I've still got some ways to go. Um, so that's what I've been writing. It's for the, um, for the Erdman series, the New International Commentary of the Old Testament. And so I've been working a lot on Daniel. What's the, what's been like the most surprising or interesting, uh, thing that you found that, that we should, we could get a preview of? Everything. <laughs> my, my mind is being totally restructured, um, about, uh, about the book, about, um, lots of the aspects of the book, although one thing that has not changed is the most important thing and the thing that everybody can see without having any kind of degree or doing special research. And that is really what the book of Daniel is all about, about how God's people try to live in critical times and how they can be faithful to him and recognize that though everything's falling apart, God is in control and his kingdom will come. That part's right on the surface. Anybody can get that. And if that's the only level of information you're looking for, don't bother reading my commentary. It'll just confuse you. Okay, so it's uh, that's there. But it's all the, the uh, you know, that's the literary theological bottom line. Okay, but I'm dealing with historical and cultural and linguistic and um, backstories and Babylonian contexts and, you know, all of those kinds of things uh, that um, are quite a bit more complicated. Do you find, uh, do you have a good explanation for why um, Daniel keeps his Hebrew name in the book, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Bendigo don't? Um, I think that's just how uh, the book took its final form uh, mm. with that kind of element. That's interesting. Well, I look forward to learning about it. You know, um, I have a five-year-old that you saw when he was in my my wife's belly. Uh, he really likes the story of Daniel. I'll let him know that <laughs> that you're writing a book. It might be a little while before he's ready to read it. Uh, thanks a lot for spending time with us, John. I'm um, really, uh, really hopeful uh, we'll get a chance to have you back sometime. And thanks for sharing with us. Sure, Josh. Good yeah, fun go conversation. And everyone else, if you're listening, thanks for joining us. Um, you know, if you're if you're new to our channel, be sure to subscribe and and see how you can uh, and be involved with this too. Thanks a lot. Uh, we'll be doing another interview really soon with uh, with Brian Gadawa on his uh, his series on Genesis to his novels on Genesis. So thanks a lot, guys, and I'll talk to you later.